Oh, hey there. I'm sure you're familiar with those things that we have to do as citizens. We have to obey the law, we have to receive basic education, we have to pay our taxes, and we have to pay back our debts. Stuff like that. Well, what if I told you that there's a way to break away and be free from all of that? I know, pretty crazy, right? And I bet you didn't know the solution would be in a silly little Nintendo game. Son of a... Animal Crossing! It's one of Nintendo's most beloved franchises, with the series selling almost 80 million units worldwide. People can't get enough of this stuff. I mean, it's just a game where you talk to animals, do chores, and make money. Why does it do so well? Those reasons are exactly why it does well. It's such a relaxing game franchise, it's just a good series to play through if you want to get away from it all. With every game that's released, it pretty much leaves the previous one in the dust. It becomes obsolete. So let's take a trip back. Back to the first Animal Crossing. What exactly was the start of this beloved franchise? Let's find out. Dobutsu no Mori, which translates to Animal Forest, is a game that was originally developed for the Nintendo 64 disk drive to utilize the clock. But due to the N64 DD being a massive dumpster fire, it was just put on a normal Nintendo 64 cartridge with a chip and a battery to keep track of the real-world time. The N64's time was coming to an end when the game released, so Nintendo ported it to the new and fresh Nintendo GameCube, where it was called Dobutsu no Mori Plus, and with that, Dobutsu no Mori Plus is what we got as Animal Crossing. When the game released, it was a massive commercial success, with companies like G4 and IGN calling it one of the best GameCube games of all time. People praised its ability to render real-world time, its customization features, and it just being a game that you can go back to frequently. Animal Crossing quickly became one of the best-selling games on the GameCube, being the seventh best-selling game on the system, outselling games like Twilight Princess, Kirby Air Ride, Pikmin, The Thousand Year Door, F-Zero GX, every single Mario sports game on the console, and every single Mario Party on the console. It became an icon of Nintendo, one of the franchises to sit beside Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Pokemon, and more. So let's take a deep dive into why this game captured the attention of over two and a half million people worldwide. This is Animal Crossing for the Nintendo GameCube. Nintendo. All right, after pressing start on the title screen, we meet Tota KK, or KK Slider, who gives us some good advice about starting our new life. He seems like a pretty cool guy, but the scene right after is me sitting on a train. Was I asleep? Was I dreaming? Was I dreaming about a random Jack Russell Terrier that sits on a stool and plays an acoustic guitar that I've never met before? Five seconds into the game and I'm going insane. This game does wonders for my social health. When we wake up, we get greeted by Rover, a cat who is trying to get every piece of information out of me that he possibly can. And he keeps making fun of my name. Why, why is he so rude? Mom, the cat from the Nintendo game is making me feel insecure! After this paint brain gets his good laugh in, he then asks where I'm going. I wanted to go to Cleveland, but it didn't fit, so it looks like I'm moving to Cleveland. After knowing this, Rover gives his friend Tom Nook a call and reports back to us that he has some new houses. Rover then asks me about buying one of them, and me, well knowing that I spent most of my bells, or money, on the stupid train ticket just to sit with him, I proceed to lie to him because he's being a jerk. Oh, hey, it looks like we're in Cleveland. Rover, I hope I never see you again. Alright, here we are in Cleveland! Here we meet Tom Nook, who introduces us to the houses we can buy. Yeah, this one looks just fine, this house can always be customized later. Now it comes to the cost, and, uh, yeah, I, I forgot, I'm, I'm pretty much broke. Nook proceeds to laugh his head off because I'm poor and makes fun of me that I can't buy the house. Like, for real, out of the three people that I've met, Porter doesn't count, he's a figment of my imagination, two of them are extremely rude to me. KK was the only one who's been nice. Anyway, Nook comes up with a solution to this situation. He wants me to work part-time at his shop to pay off the house, so I go there to apply for my new job. I have quite a bit of bells to pay off, so our first job is to plant some flowers. Alright, this seems easy enough. Done. After that, Nook wants us to talk to everyone in town. The villagers you get in your town are always random. It looks like in Cleveland we have Hugh, Murphy, Pippi, Tank, Pecan, and Kiki. They all seem like nice neighbors. Murphy kind of smells like pennies, but it sounds like we got a good crew. 
It looks like our next job is to deliver some furniture to Pecan. Okay, sounds simple enough. She's only two acres away from the shop. All right, here you go, Pecan. Oh, oh why, why did you have to do this, Pecan? You're, you're dead to me. All right, after I got over my hurt feelings, Tom Nook has been sitting here doing nothing, so he just tells me to work for the villagers. Doing tasks for your villagers is something I really like about the original Animal Crossing. If you're bored in your little town, you can ask for a job. In other Animal Crossing games, it's completely random when a villager will ask you to do something for them. But in this game, you can just demand to help them out. See, I see you're about to go fishing, but by any chance, do you need your gutters cleaned? Most of the time, jobs are either deliveries or getting something from someone's house because so-and-so left it there. It's all pretty much gambling at the end of the day. You spend your time doing these jobs, sometimes you can get some cool stuff for your house, and then there's times where you can actually get paid. But there's other times where you're given paper as a reward, something I can buy at the shop for super cheap. There's times where you can be given wallpaper and carpet as rewards and clothing too. Alright, here you go, Murphy. Oh, it looks like he's gonna give me the shirt that he was just wearing? Thanks. Even though sometimes the rewards are lame, I still enjoy doing these goofy little tasks. After that, Tom Nook wants me to advertise the shop. Okay, sounds simple enough. Perfect! Alright, we did it. We did all of Nook's work for him. Now he's actually letting us live our life. We still have to pay back all of our debt, or he'll send out the... The, the raccoon goons? Oh. Oh, oh, oh no. No, no, not the raccoon goons. Here, take it. T take it all. Okay, so starting now, this is the actual game. We can talk to our villager friends, buy and sell things, sit and hide in our house and fear the raccoon mafia. It's, it's great. For real though, a whole new world of activities lay in front of us now that we're free from Tom Nook's clutches. We're able to buy things from his shop like furniture, clothes, paper, and tools. Using the tools to get items is your primary way of making money to pay off your house and to buy other things. The bug net and the fishing pole allow you to catch all different kinds of bugs and fish throughout the year. For bugs, they can be found on trees, tree stumps, in the air, or on flowers and rocks. Some bugs you have to approach very sneakily and quietly, and there are other bugs where you have to run at them super fast. Bug catching was never really my thing, and it still isn't, but I do enjoy it from time to time. Now fishing! Fishing is fun! It's pretty much the same exact thing as bug catching, but this time around water. Like I said, these are pretty similar, but fish usually sell for more and they're easier to find, so I always preferred fishing. Both bugs and fish can be donated to the museum as well as sold at the shop. You don't have to donate anything to the museum, but it does give the game more of a collecting feel to it. There are people who choose not to donate anything, and these people stand out amongst the jury. Th that, that guy keeps his fish! There are other things you can donate to the museum, like art, which you can buy at the shop when it's available, and also fossils, which you can dig up out of the ground with a shovel. To me, the fossil mechanic is one of the funnest parts about Animal Crossing as a whole, but in this game, it's probably one of the most tedious. In Wild World and On, you can dig up the fossil, take it to Blathers the Owl, the owner of the museum, then he identifies it and displays it in the museum. It's a very reasonable and convenient way of doing things. But in this game, Blathers has a bit of a skill issue, and he doesn't know how to identify the fossils, so he orders you to go to the post office and mail the fossils to the Faraway Museum, then you get them tomorrow, and then you can show them to Blathers so he can display them. Why can't he just, oh, I don't know, examine the fossils right there? Like I said, in every other game, Blathers can just identify the fossil on a whim. He'll be like, oh yeah, that's a Pippin Pataloxicopolis metacarpus. But in this game, he doesn't have the power to diagnose what the fossil is, so you just have to go to the post office and mail your fossils one by one. Oh, it's because he doesn't have his degree in paleontology. Okay, from a charming standpoint, this makes sense, but from an actual gameplay standpoint, this is just annoying. I know I'm being way too harsh on this, especially being the first entry, but still, that extra hurdle with the mailing system does not need to be in. One plus about fossils is that most of them sell for a high price, so combine fossil hunting with fishing and you'll be making bank in no time. So yeah, donating to the museum is still one of my favorite parts about this game, and Animal Crossing in general. In this first game, it's a bit of a drag, but it's still fun to collect and display the pieces. Near the Cleveland Museum, we have the Tailor. In this place, you can make fashion designs for you and other villagers in your town. I love this part about Animal Crossing, even though I'm really bad at making designs. This is still cool. It's neat seeing your villagers go from their default clothes to something really cool that you made, or something really stupid. 
This feature of the game also allows use of the Game Boy Advance and the e-reader to scan in new designs. We'll get more in depth with the e-reader here in a bit. Going back to the post office for a moment, this is obviously where you mail letters. You can write kind enough building letters to your villagers and also threats to leave the village. There's also the e-station, which is where you connect your e-reader to the Game Boy Advance and then connect that to your GameCube and then you scan your e-reader card. There's e-reader cards for items and furniture, but the primary ones are the character cards. The character cards when scanned gives you a few neat bonuses, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. They were definitely going for more of a collectible thing with these, or almost like a collectible trading card game like Pokemon at Dragon Ball Super, while the newer amiibo cards are much more useful in terms of gameplay. Outside of the post office is where you can compose a town tune. If you're bad at making music like I am, you can just have the e-reader do it for you, but the town tune isn't a necessity, so you can just cram a bunch of notes together and boom, forget about it for the rest of the game. Oh yeah, there's also the police station, which, copper on the outside, gives you information on lost items and events that happen in your town. And there's Booker inside the police station who runs the Lost and Found. He's pretty bad at his job, so similar to the dump, he lets you take everything. Whenever you do this, there's a bit of a guilty feeling that goes over you. That thing that you just took from the police station may have belonged to Murphy. Moving back to Tom Nook's shop, when you spend enough bells or sell enough items, the shop will eventually expand, so it'll offer more items a day. The final expansion of the shop can only be acquired when you spend so many bells or sell, and a visitor to your town has to buy something. That means if you're an only child, you will most likely never experience the thrill and beauty that is Nookington's. Another thing with the shop is that at the end of the month, Nook holds a raffle to get sweet prizes. You get raffle tickets by buying furniture and other considerably more expensive stuff. This is a neat mechanic, it gives more of a reason to buy furniture from my home, and I'm able to get cool stuff out of it. Problem is, I have a tough time remembering it's the end of the month, so I completely forget all about the raffle. Now, as much as you may not like to care or pay attention to it, or maybe you just prefer to use it as a storage shed, but your house is a key part of the game. I like keeping my fake house neat, and in this game you are very... helpfully encouraged by the HRA. Yeah, it's rude and it hurts my feelings, but at least they're not getting choppers and carrying my house away. Or worse, Mook sends the raccoon goons. Going back to what I said about keeping your house neat and cool, there's a lot of furniture you can buy. My personal favorite piece of furniture being VIDEO GAMES! Yes, with the help of special events and telling cheat codes to Tom Nook and other villagers, you can collect a pretty decent NES library inside of Animal Crossing. This is my Wario Woods plus one golf room. This is definitely my favorite part of the original game. There's quite the variety too, with a pretty large selection of earlier titles in the NES's life. There are some that are harder to get than others, however, there are four games that are very infamous and are extremely hard to obtain, or completely unobtainable. These games are coined the Forbidden Four. These games are Mario Brothers, Ice Climber, Super Mario Brothers, and The Legend of Zelda. Mario Brothers and Ice Climber aren't as forbidden as the other two, but still near impossible. They're only obtainable through their specific Animal Crossing NES game e-reader card. And after my extensive research, I have concluded that these cards are extremely rare. The Ice Climber one I found online for nearly $200, and I still can't find the Mario Brothers one, but it does exist out there somewhere. So we know Ice Climber and Mario Brothers are still obtainable, you're going to have to break the bank for it, but at least we have comfort knowing that we can play these games on our NES, inside of our house in Animal Crossing on our Nintendo GameCube. Super Mario Brothers is almost completely unobtainable, what, what am I saying, it, it pretty much is. It was only obtainable through a Famitsu magazine giveaway, with only 30 winners. The game was put on the giveaway memory card, so yeah, only 30 of these memory cards exist. We have some of them not working anymore, lost, possibly destroyed, or maybe one of the winners was a little hungry, I don't know. And then there's The Legend of Zelda. This one is completely unobtainable. No code, no event, no e-reader card, no giveaways or anything like that. The ROM is in Animal Crossing, but there's no way it can actually be played. Officially. All of the NES games, including the Forbidden Four, can be played using a cheat device such as an action replay disc, which is why you can see me here playing The Legend of Zelda. Using this external method does eliminate that feeling of mystery around the Forbidden Four, but it's still really cool to see all of these games being played here. As mentioned earlier, there are special events that can happen throughout the year, some of my favorites being the Cherry Blossom Festival and the Meteor Shower. Throughout these events, villagers and other visitors can give you special items exclusive to that event. My favorite event in the original game has to be Sail Day. 
This is an event that occurs on the fourth Friday of November, where Tom Nook sells grab bags which contain three random items. There's much smaller events too, like a visitor dropping by in your town. These visitors can offer you some items, carpets, designs, and even hold tournaments. All of them are great, but my personal favorite has to be Red. He runs the black market, and you can buy good items sometimes and bad items sometimes, all for high prices. I mean, yeah, I know he's scamming me, but he set up his tent and everything. It'd be rude not to give my credit card. Even if you make a bad purchase, you can just reset the game, right? You thought you were safe! Okay, you can still reset if you really want to, but Mr. Rossetti, and sometimes his brother Don, is always watching you in your every move, your every lean forward to hit that reset button. The game encourages you not to reset and to play the game fairly. Every time you hit the reset button, Rossetti will get angrier and angrier with you until he can't take it anymore, and he'll reset your game. Not that day. No. Everything. All of your save data. So it turns out that Rossetti was pretty much playing a prank on us this whole time. I'm not mad, but I'm not happy about this either. I don't know how to feel about this, therefore I have no further comments on this matter. KK Slider can also visit your town, playing his music on Saturday nights. You can request a song for him to play, or you can let him choose, and when he plays a song, the credits roll. Something about this just gives off a super heartwarming vibe, and after he plays the song, he'll give you a copy of the song that you can play inside your house, which is really cool. Alright, there's pretty much one other thing you can do, but you need a Game Boy Advance and a Link Cable to do said thing. Animal Island is a small place out in the ocean close to your village. By connecting your Game Boy Advance to the game as mentioned earlier, Cap'n can take you on a boat ride to the island. This place has exclusive items, bugs, fish, and fruit, and there's also a random villager on the island as well. On top of that, there's a secondary house there for storage, or for just having a second house. You can also put up your very own flag on the island to show O'Hare that you walked on the island, even though he was before you. So yeah, nothing big, but it's a neat feature to get away from the usual day-to-day -day Animal Crossing routine. Alright, we paid off our last debt to Tom Nook. He can't expand our house anymore. He even built a statue in my honor. And the best part is, I'm completely debt-free! But, uh... N now what? So, that was pretty much the original Animal Crossing. Is it primitive? Yes, it is. Very much so. With a strange fossil mechanic, limited inventory room, and other odd and end stuff like that, it does make the game feel somewhat dated. Is the game charming? Absolutely. This is one of the most charming games I've ever played, and the characters, locations, conversations, errands, music, and collectibles are all huge factors of why the game is amazing. It's really no wonder why this game became so popular in an instant. It's really good. Now, is this the definitive Animal Crossing experience? Is this a good one to recommend to a friend? Uh... No. If you or someone you know wants to get into the series, just play the newest one that comes out. The newest entry in any series will pretty much always be the most convenient one to get, with tons of features and a very active player base. So I guess the message I'm trying to convey here is play the new game, and if you like it, take a trip back and see where this amazing franchise began.